If you have your Bibles this morning, why don't you turn to Paul's letter to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15. So in a moment we're going to read 1 Timothy 1. Um, I do have an apology to make. My wife tells me that uh, in my excitement in preaching last Sunday, I may have erroneously communicated something to you. When we talked about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, and they first were on the, uh, the boundary of, uh, of the promised land, and the spies went out, and Steve Love is laughing right now, and the spies went out to, to, uh, to scout out the land, and, uh, and they were all too afraid to, to go in except for, uh, uh, for Joshua and Caleb. Well, apparently, when I talked about that, I referred to them as having walked in the wilderness for 40 years and then was sent back for another 40 years. If that's what I did say, I do apologize. I'm not convinced that I did. Okay, I haven't gone back to the sermon to check because most likely Cassandra's wrong and I'm right. (laughs) But if I really did say that, then in my defense, as most of you know, Cassandra writes the sermon, so all I was doing was reading the script. Okay. So there we have an apology from Cassandra. Okay, so why don't you bow your heads and let's pray together. Father, thank you for your beautiful and your holy word by which we are sanctified, through which we are transformed, Lord. We are a privileged people to sit together today and to learn together from this beautiful and profound word. And as we do, I ask Jesus that you would make our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our minds to understand and our hearts to receive your word today, that we might prove by experience that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And O Lord, may I be nothing, that Jesus, you be everything, as you teach us by your Holy Spirit to the praise of the glory of your beautiful, your wonderful, your outrageous and your scandalous grace. We humbly pray. Amen. So as we enter into Advent season, it is my fear that for many the Christmas story has been romanticized and commercialized. And as a result of that, there are many who cease to be in awe of just what it means for the God-man to come to earth and to rescue a world of sinners. For many, the whole celebration of Christmas is nothing more than merrymaking. It's nothing more than partying, nothing more than holidaying. It's nothing more than just a short, brief break as we see the end of one year and we embrace the beginning of another year. Yet on the contrary, church, we are reminded that Christmas is not just a holiday period in our calendar year that we celebrate year after year after year, but Christmas, that Advent season, is a life-changing, pivotal moment in the history of humankind, and as a result of that moment, humankind has been changed forever. And so this morning we're going to start a three-part series, um, and we're going to be looking at a series titled The Cradle, the Cross, and the Crown. The Cradle, the Cross, and the Crown. Now, some of you may already be thinking, well, I can understand why we're going to be looking at the cradle, but surely we're a few months too early as we talk about the cross and we talk about the crown. Surely that's something which ought to be kept for Easter celebration. But church, it's important for us to understand that we cannot celebrate the cradle if we're not prepared to celebrate the cross. And we cannot celebrate and talk about the cross if we're not prepared to celebrate and to talk about the crown. We need to understand that the Bethlehem story does not stand alone apart from the Calvary story, and the story of Calvary cannot stand on its own apart from the story of Bethlehem's babe. 
And so, Lord willing, we're going to take the next few weeks to be looking at this series titled The Cradle, the Cross, and the Crown, or stated differently, Christ's birth, Christ's death, and Christ's enthronement. And so we're going to read from uh, Paul's letter to his protege, Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 through to 17. I'm reading from the New King James Version this morning. But you follow with me in your Bibles. It may seem like a strange passage of Scripture from which we'll be working when we talk about Advent season. One might think that we're going to go into the Gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But really, and we are going to be looking at a, a various passage of Scripture, but this is the springboard from which we're going to be going into our series this morning. Follow with me in your Bibles. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, Paul pens these words. This is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And so this morning I really just want to be focusing on verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And the heart of our series is this, church, that humankind's hope of salvation, promise of redemption, and assurance of resurrection are met in the cradle, the cross, and the crown. A story is told of how during the Second World War, there was a mother who would take her son and every night she would show him a portrait of his father who was at war. And one particular night that she took him to the portrait and, sh and showed him the portrait of his dad in the hopes that he wouldn't forget his father during that extended time that he was away from the family, a little boy turned around and said, uh, this little boy turned around and said to his mother, wouldn't it be great if dad could just step out of the frame? And as we celebrate Advent, we're reminded that that is exactly what Jesus Christ did, church. Jesus Christ stepped out of the framework of eternity. Jesus Christ stepped out of eternity outside of time as we understand it. And he stepped into your world and he stepped into my world. And we really need to try to get our minds around this profound mystery that Jesus left the majesty of heaven for the fallenness of earth. He left the choir of angels for the worship of bewildered shepherds. He who was robed in splendor now lay wrapped in swaddling clothes. The, ha the hand that had flung stars into space was now a little hand around, uh, around the, the, the finger of his, his mother Mary. The mouth that spoke creation into being, now cooing so sweetly and gently with infant babblings. The one who was seated on a throne is now lying in a feeding trough. If we could ever get our minds around that profound mystery. God becoming a man. He who was omnipotent. He who was omnipresent, he who was omniscient, taking on a human body. God stepping into our world from outside of time, stepping out of the framework of time, and coming to this earth. As the Apostle Paul reminds us in Philippians, Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. So yes, this God who takes on the form of a bondservant surrenders all of his rights as God. And not only that, he takes the step down and he, he takes on the form of a man in order to reach out to a world of lost sinners. So for centuries we find that humankind had been gazing upon the heavens, waiting for this God to step out of the framework of eternity, and suddenly and finally Jesus does that. Through prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, God had pre been preparing His people for this one momentous event in the life of humankind. As we look at Scripture and as we walk through the pages of Scripture, God spoke to Abraham. He revealed the nation 
to which this babe would be born. The nation Israel. God spoke to Jacob and said, here's the tribe from which this child will come. The tribe of Judah. He, um, as we continue walking through this, he speaks to Micah and reveals the place where this child will be born, which is the town of Bethlehem. Through Daniel, he talks about the, the, those, those uh, events that will surround his birth. And then we find cradled in a manger on that first Christmas were all the hopes and dreams of a hopeless, helpless, dying world. The Apostle Paul reminds us in Galatians of humankind's dilemma. He says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. 700 years before Jesus came, uh, we sang of the words penned by the, the prophet Isaiah. And then 700 years later, we see the long-awaited Messiah in the gospel accounts. Luke chapter 2. And so it was, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told by the shepherds. But Mary kept all of these things and pondered them in her, in her heart. And then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. And as we go on into Matthew chapter 2, when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding, exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him of gold, of frankincense, and of myrrh. And the beauty of this profound mystery, church, is what was going on here is the one who was invisible was made visible, and the one who was untouchable was finally and suddenly touchable. And as news spread, and as people marveled, the world came to know that the Christ had finally arrived. And when a child is born and a baby is born, and last week we celebrated three babies that had been born in this church family, how might we, ex how might we describe a, a newborn baby? Cute? Right? That's a good start, Pen. Bundle of joy? Sinless? Smelly and noisy. Smelly and noisy. There's a granddad talking. The wonder of God's creation. What else? Beautiful. Helpless. Sorry. Adorable. Innocent. You say Christ-like? Someone said something else there? What else? Sorry? Blessing. Blessing. Is that what you said? Who said that? Derek? Blessing. Blessing, right? Okay, so these may be some of the ways that we gaze upon these babies. Beautiful, adorable, cute, smelly and noisy. Okay, and there are other ways to describe them. Now get a hold of what uh, John says in John chapter 1 and verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. So John's talking about Jesus coming to earth, and he says, and we gaze upon Him, and He was what? He was glorious. You ever looked upon a newborn baby and said, now this is glorious? But that's exactly how John describes Jesus. So Jesus, uh, or, you know, yes, I'm not saying that He wasn't cute. He was cute. Not just that he was adorable, although he was adorable. Not just that he was beautiful, because he was beautiful. But John says, we beheld the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. He was glorious. What a way to describe the God child. And as the angels fell down, and as they worshipped, and as they went out excitedly, and they spread the word, we see Mary sitting there, and she pondered these things quietly in her heart, because she had some inside information about the, the, the life 
and the ministry of the God-man. You see, friends, when a child is born, parents have hopes and parents have dreams and parents have aspirations and expectations for their children. Hopes of, of what their children, who their children might grow up to be. Hopes and dreams of the careers and the paths that they will choose. And yet that Mary sits there and she ponders the words that were spoken to Joseph through his encounter of the angel. And Mary would recall those chilling words, but while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now here's the point I want to get to this morning, church, is we would do well to remember that Jesus did not come to heal the sick. Contrary to what many people believe, Jesus did not come to make the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the lame to walk, and the mute to speak. That is not why Jesus came. And what we need to understand very, very clearly here is that Jesus came with one purpose and one purpose in mind. And what was that? Jesus Christ came to die in order that he might save. That's why Jesus Christ came. And, and some of you may be sitting and saying, but Jesus did make the blind to see, and he did make the deaf to hear, and he did make the lame to walk, and he did make the mute to speak. And that's correct. Those are some of the things that Jesus did as he went about his ministry here on earth. But that was not the goal or the mission of Jesus coming to earth. Some of you will say, but the scripture says in John 9, 39, and Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be blind. Jesus is not talking about spiritual physical healing here it's actually he's actually targeting the the scribes and the pharisees who knew the truth and had the truth and yet did not live the truth and so uh, there are a whole bunch of people and these false prophets who have built this whole uh, and as, as i refer to a uh, a false garbage we don't call it a gospel. There's only one gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's this false garbage that is built on this idea that that's the whole reason Jesus came. Is that I might be comfortable. Is that I might be healed of my illnesses and my sicknesses. That is not why Jesus came. And if that's our understanding, then we have diminished the work of the cradle, the crown, uh, the cross and the crown, church. Jesus Christ came to save people from their sins. Jesus was born. He was a child who was born to die. And so as we gaze upon, as we go back and gaze upon a scene of a child lying in a feeding trough, there's so many people who love that idea. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I don't, I don't want any more. I'm quite happy with a child lying in a feeding trough. But the whole problem with that, and the whole reason that so many people are so comfortable with a baby lying in a manger, is because a baby lying in a manger doesn't point a finger. A baby lying in a manger does not speak out and call out our sin. A baby lying in a manger doesn't speak out and tell us how wretched and depraved and broken and desperate we are. And so people are happy with an infant, an infant babblings, who, who doesn't call me out. and doesn't speak about how wretched and depraved and broken and damaged I am. But a God-man does. And that's why we find that the, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is so offensive to so many. Because as this boy child grew up, he started to call people out. He started to speak about sin. He started to proclaim his kingdom. He started to speak about matters of eternal life. And that's why the Apostle Paul, as he writes to Timothy, he says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world not so that I can be more comfortable. Not so that I can have my wish list extended to me. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And the only way that he could save sinners was by dying on the cross and taking our sin upon himself. The heart of the gospel and the mission of Jesus and the good news of Jesus, friends, is encapsulated in that short verse right there. That Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. 
Repeatedly over and over and over again as we sum up the ministry of Jesus. Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. And He came to call sinners to repentance. Jesus did not come to be a good storyteller. Even though He was a good storyteller. He did not come to heal the sick even though He healed the sick. He did not come to feed the hungry, even though He did feed the hungry. He did not come to overthrow the Roman government like many had hoped that He would. His singular purpose was to save sinners from the coming wrath of God. We would do well to remember that as we come into this Advent season this year. Not only are people happy with a baby lying in a feeding trough. People are happy with the music of Christmas, but not the message of Christmas. You guys get that? We're happy to sing the carols. We're happy to play the music in our homes. We're happy to pull out the Christmas tree and pull out the decorations. We're happy to put the Christmas stocking uh, on the fireplace. We're happy with the music. It's the message that people don't like. It's the message that the world finds offensive. Because the gospel message of Jesus Christ demands change. The gospel message of Jesus Christ demands repentance and confession. The gospel message of Jesus Christ reminds us how utterly lost we are apart from Jesus. It's the message that we need to come back to. There are many who like the Christmas story. There are many who like this idea of the angels' visit to Mary and Joseph, the announcement of the virgin birth. There are many who like the idea of angels gathering around and singing glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. Because it's a heartwarming story. It's a heartwarming story of shepherds coming from the, uh, following the star in the east. There are many who like the idea of that first Christmas scene of gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. It makes us feel all good inside church. There are many who even like the Christmas mince pies and nothing more than that. But friends, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't celebrate. I'm not saying don't get excited. I'm not knocking the joy and the excitement and celebration of Christmas. But if that's all that Christmas is to us, then it's best we do not celebrate. Because we're celebrating the wrong kind of Advent. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That's why He came. Sinners like Darren Pickard. Sinners like you. Sinners like every person who walks this earth. He came to save sinners. And this is why we can celebrate Advent. And so, as we gaze upon the cradle, we remember that first Christmas celebration. And what do we celebrate? We celebrate the saving work of Jesus Christ. And church, as we come to a close this morning, and as we gaze upon God's Word, and as our hearts reflect that Advent, let's be sure to have an accurate, biblically founded view in our hearts of why it was that Jesus came. And so I want to ask you a couple of questions this morning. The first question is, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? The first thing that comes into your mind is this help, seemingly helpless babe lying in a feeding trough. Friend, you're not reading the Bible right. I ask you the question, who is Jesus to you? If Jesus isn't more than a baby in a feeding trough, then the frightening reality is He is not able to handle your sin and my sin. And I don't know about you, but I need a Jesus who can handle my sin. Is He the Jesus who saves from sin? And if He is the Jesus who saves from sin, have you been saved from your sin? Is there someone seated here today who has never made a declaration of faith in Jesus that is humankind's greatest need is that we might be saved from our sin. Has Jesus Christ saved you from your sin? And if He has saved you from your sin, am I living in light of that great salvation? 
Am I living in light to the fact that that Advent that we celebrate, that there's a great Advent still to come when we will gaze upon Jesus in all of His beauty and His glory and His wonder, His majesty and His splendor, and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we can be sure about that day, church. But it's got to affect and it's got to impact how we live today. And so as we get into this Advent season, as we interact with family and with friends and many who do not know the Lord, what picture of Jesus are they getting from what they see in your life and my life? You see, humankind's hope of salvation, promise of redemption, and assurance of resurrection are in the cradle, the cross, and the crown. And let's not get caught up in the romanticism of Christmas that we miss the story of the Christ of Christmas. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Lord Jesus, I don't believe that this side of heaven we will fully be able to comprom uh, comprehend in our, in our minds, Lord, just what it means. God became a man. We'll never be able to fully appreciate, Lord, with gratitude and thanksgiving, what it meant when you stepped out of the framework of eternity and you stepped into our world. And today we want to thank you, Jesus. We thank you that you came to save. That you were born to die. That that was your mission and your goal in coming to earth. Was to die so that we might live. And so today, Lord, we do thank you for the cradle. But Lord, we want to hasten to thank you for the cross, uh, for the crown, uh, the cross, Lord. And we want to thank you for the crown. And if there be anybody here today, Lord, who has not surrendered their life to you, any who, anyone who does not know that salvation that you came to give, friend, will you consider that great decision today, greatest decision any man, woman, boy, and girl can ever make? What will you do with the person of Jesus? Would you place your confidence and your trust in Him? Would you abandon all and lay hold of Him today? Repenting and con confessing of sin and placing your faith and confidence in Him, would you decide today, Lord, I want to live a life that honors and pleases you as I look forward to your glorious and imminent return? And friend, for those of us who sit here today, and as we once again in this calendar year enter this Advent season, let's be sure that we're celebrating Jesus in the right way. And let's be sure that we're living in such a way that the world still living in darkness might see the light of Christmas in the person of Jesus Christ. And may we be those vessels and those instruments in whom and through whom God can work. Father, thank you for salvation so great as this. And yet we're reminded today of how costly it was as it cost you your life. We love you. We bless you. We worship you. And we thank you, author of salvation and lover of our souls. Amen.